Hey, it's Fryfest TV, and of course, who do we have turning up like a bad penny year after year after year? It's Adam Green. <laughs> Adam. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> well, you know we love you so much. Now, this time you're back, not with Hatchet 20, but with uh, a film called Digging Up the Marrow, which is actually quite an unusual film for you. So why did you want to do it? Because it's more a document, mockumentary fact. So tell us about it. Yeah, I don't even know really what subgenre it falls under, but it, it started four years ago. We've been working on it for that long. And what happened was uh, Frozen was in Sundance. And unfortunately in America, we already had distribution for it with a place that doesn't really do theatrical distribution all that well. And so we were pretty disappointed when we came back from Sundance and there were all these other places that wanted it and we knew what we were in for. And we started thinking like, how can we just do something that's just ours? We don't need other producers or anybody involved as a negative pickup, and we can just be creative and do something weird. And that particular day, you know, I get the weirdest stuff sent to me by fans, which I really appreciate. And um, <laughs> one of them was a, a package from a guy that was claiming that Victor Crowley from the Hatchet movies is real and that I fucked it all up and I didn't tell the story right. And so when you go through this thing, there's pictures of swamps and areas circled. This is where he was born and this is where the murders happened. It was, it was really creative. And I said to the other guys at Aeriscope, I'm like, well, what about this? What if we went and interviewed this guy? You know, it might be a funny short film. I mean, clearly he's crazy. And then they were like, yeah, or he'll deliverance you out in the swamp. And I'm like, yeah, let's not do that. Um, but that same weekend, I was signing autographs at a Fangoria convention, and this guy came through the line with a pamphlet called Digging Up the Marrow. And he put it down in front of me, and he said, thanks for the inspiration, and walked away. And I realized it was artwork by Alex Pardee, who's one of my favorite artists. I just didn't know what he looked like. And the pamphlet was from an art show he did. All of his art shows have a storyline. And this particular one was that a former Boston police detective had contacted him claiming that monsters are real and he knows where they are and that he had commissioned Alex to paint what he had seen. And I was like, wait a minute, we put these two things together and make monsters that look like Alex's art. And then we just sort of started interviewing people and it just kept going and, and went in all these crazy directions. But that's why it's kind of a hard movie to describe mm -hmm. because it's not quite a mockumentary. It's not a found footage movie. Everybody in it is really playing themselves, except for uh, Decker, the cop, who's played by Ray Wise. And the reason we did that was so that nobody would think we're trying to hoax them, because mm. right out of the gate, we want people to know, like, it's just a movie. It's just being told in a way that hopefully suspends your disbelief a little bit more than usual. And uh, here we are. But we've purposely not released the trailer. We haven't released stills. And we had said we're making an art documentary just so nobody would be interested and leave us alone, which is very funny in the horror community. As soon as you say art documentary, nobody wants anything to do with you. So that way we didn't have to deal with set visits or casting information or stills. Because yeah, but it was you. They knew it was not an art documentary, surely, that you suddenly had not changed tag. I think because Alex was involved, they believed it was an art documentary. And we only did that to keep anonymity... anonymity, anonymity Anonymity. Anonymity. Anonymous. To stay <laughs> uh, under the radar, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and, it, and it worked. Anonymity. So, yes. <laughs> that one. <laughs> Um, we showed a rough cut at Bunnamathon, which is uh, this 24-hour movie festival that Harry Knowles does in Austin, just to see if it would play or not. And that was not a horror crowd, so I was like, this, is, this will be a good test. And, um, and it played great, and they were terrified, which for Alex and I, we were a little taken aback by that, because I don't think it's all that frightening as much as it is cool. Like For all of us who love monsters and wish that they were real, um, but apparently it's pretty scary. So I mean, we'll see what the crowd here thinks, though, because this is, this is pretty hardcore. So, mm. And because I remember when I first watched it, you came back with all these questions to me, saying, you know, like, well, what do you think of this? And what's that? And what do you think? Of and so I came back with this explanation. And I'm sure everyone has their own sort of interpretation of it, really, don't they? So yeah. you're going to fight that a lot, I think, this afternoon. Though People are going to say, well, this, this, this. And you're going to go, no, I didn't think of that, that, that. So yeah. it's interesting. And, and that's kind of the joy of it. That's what I loved about... Um, Spiral, which I was here with in 07, was 
there's a lot left to the imagination and hearing what people think, you know, with, with Spiral, everybody was like, well, what was the last pose? And were the girls real? Um, and Joel, David Moore and I, we don't, we never answer that because once we give an answer, that becomes the answer. So it's more fun to sort of let people decide for themselves. And this is definitely a, a thinking person's movie, which is why Fright Fest is probably the only festival we're going to do. I mean, this audience is heads and tails above everybody. I mean, it's very, very smart. They've seen every horror movie out there and they like movies that make them think. It's not just blood and gore coming from the guy who made Hatchet <laughs> 1 through 9, 6, 4, 3. We've only, made, we've only made 3. That's not even that bad when you really think about it. <laughs> don't do Hatchet 4. It just um, seems, no, I won't. I won't. It, just, <laughs> it just seems like it. But, yes. No, but I mean, it is... It, you put yourself in it quite a lot. I mean, it's like a, there's a lot of your personal life in it. There's a lot of you. I mean, you know, usually we just see you in a cameo in Hatchet, like in the first 10 seconds. But this time, it's really quite a lot of you in this, isn't it? Well, that was sort of the whole conceit of it was to use ourselves and our real lives as the jumping off point. And when you think about it, if we had made up a fictitious cult filmmaker, it wouldn't have that same documentary feel because you'd be watching it being like, this isn't a real filmmaker. I've never even heard of any of these movies, which sadly 90% of the people who see it are going to be thinking anyway. But um, that was really what made this special, I think. And as you're watching it, you're seeing real people, you're seeing our real studio, our offices. Um, I wasn't stupid enough to show my real house. Um, because the first I, question I asked you, is that your real house? It's fabulous, why? <laughs> you must be doing really well. <laughs> I, my house is really nice, but I didn't want to show my, because you know we showed the front door and all that, and like I've learned over the years that there's some fans that don't understand how to not cross the line. Uh, um, no, no. Yeah, we've had a few that have shown up at Aeriscope, and um, there's been a few pretty scary in interactions. Um, the, the, the two scariest was um, I tend to wake up at like two in the morning and that's when I go in and write. And 6 a.m., somebody had forgotten to lock the front gate. And I look up and there's this huge guy just sweating and just standing in the office. And it was kind of like Chop Top and Texas Chainsaw too. He's just wandering around looking at things. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but you, you, you can't be in here. And he's like, you're, you're the guy, right? And I'm like, I, what, what, who, what guy? And I'm like, really, you need to go. And then he starts getting angry. And he's like, oh, I understand. I could pay to see that one in the theater and that one in the theater and that one. No, I'm not cool enough to come. And all the weapons on the walls are <laughs> fake. You know, they're all rubber. And I'm like, I'm going to die right now. And eventually he just wandered out. And so we now make extra sure that the front gate is locked. Um, and then there's, there's been a few that have waited outside in the bushes um, for when like, I'll leave at night. It was really it was the TV show that did it. I think as a director, the only people that recognize you, usually it's at film festivals or maybe in a movie theater, but most people don't care about the director and know what they look like. But then once Holliston happened, that's when it started to get a little mm -hmm. bit weirder. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, there was no other way to do this particular story without all of us Lovely. actually being you in just it. remind me of an S&M man do you remember the JT Petty yes you, you never bought it because you knew that person wasn't real so you're absolutely right I understand now why you did that yeah and um, another movie that I really liked was uh, Poughkeepsie Tapes oh. and the issue that I saw on the festival circuit was that um, and I don't know if this was the filmmakers idea or the people at the festivals but they would try to tell the audience that it was real and then about 20 minutes in, when you'd realize it wasn't, people would turn on the movie. Instead mm. of just saying, okay, it's not real, they would be like, nope, didn't get me, movie doesn't work. And so that's why we have Ray Wise, so that you know. And there's already been a few um, other filmmakers that, that I was showing it to along the way with editing. And they would say, well, your biggest mistake was casting Ray Wise, because once I saw him, I knew this wasn't real. And I would always say, so 10 minutes later, when the first monster showed up, you, you, did, you were going to think this was real? And then they're like, oh, yeah, that's a threat. So. <laughs> I mean, where, where was the actual location where the, the monsters were? I mean, was that like where, LA, obviously? But where? Yeah, uh, it was out in a place called Santa Clarita, which was mm -hmm. actually only 10 minutes from where we shot the first hatchet. Um, and we found uh, just this guy who owned all this property. And... At first, it didn't look like it was going to happen. And he's like, well, what kind of movie is this? I'm like, well, it's a horror movie. And he's, then he really didn't re want to do it. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what other movies have you made? I'm like, you, you've never heard of them. And he's like, well, try me. I'm like, 
Frozen, not the Disney one. And he's like, the, the chairlift one? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you, you can have whatever you want. You, you totally shoot here. And can my kids come? And will you sign all this? So thankfully, that, that the guy who saw Frozen just happened to be the, the one um, that we needed his property for. So uh, that's where we, we shot everything. And a lot of it um, was built as well. Um, at, to spoil things a little bit, at some point, we do see in there. And that was all built in the courtyard at the Aeroscope mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. And of course, the basement. Yes, which uh, that whole thing is actually my editor's house, uh, which he was sort of, uh, it's been remodeled since then. But at the time, I'm like, we need a place that just looks abandoned and sh Ed, what about your house? <laughs> <laughs> And um, he, did, he wasn't offended by that, so that, was, that worked out well. <laughs> I mean, what, you, you said you're going to try and do a sort of um, like a four wall situation where you're going to take it to different cities in America and do the whole thing. I mean, is that, that's the release plan for this, isn't it? Yeah, from the get go, we wanted to do something that we could control. And normally, what happens is there's either a distributor involved from the get go, or uh, once you sell it, they take all the rights. So what we've been working on, at least in America, is trying to keep the theatrical rights with, with Aeroscope, with my company. And the reason being is that way a mainstream distributor could do video on demand and DVD and Blu-ray and all that stuff, but as long as they wait and give us the chance to go out with it theatrically first, and we, would, we just want to make it an event. So we would travel from city to city and have the actual art exhibit and obviously the movie and a Q&A, maybe even bring some of the monsters, mm -hmm. which are amazing to see in person because most of them are animatronic or puppets or there's actually only one that actually has a human being inside it um, in the movie. So uh, for people to get to see all of that stuff would be really cool. And because Alex is such a celebrated artist, we would have a different print for each city that was specific to that city. And if we do that and do maybe, let's say, 10, 15, maybe even 20 cities, and all that money is going back into the film, that way the distributor, because that's where they get you, is they're like, oh, we're going to do a theatrical release, and then they'll do anything from four screens to 100 screens, and all of a sudden they tell you that that costs them $1.3 million to do. And that's why your movie hasn't made money yet. And it's been hard because in negotiating with these various distributors that want it, they don't want to give up the right to do that. And they don't come right out and say it, but I did get an off-the-record call from somebody at one of them who said, that's exactly why we don't want to give that up, because that's where we hide what it made. So um, watching what Darren Bowsman did with Repo and Devil's Carnival and even what Kevin Smith is doing... I mean, I think with Kevin Smith, it's just really the movie and having him there. But I mean, for his fans, that's really special to have that. So we would probably have to charge a little bit more per ticket in order to travel the art show and all the other stuff. But I think it'll be fun. It'll be something different. Um, and this isn't really like a event movie because it's kind of like, you know, a documentary. So it's not like Devil's Carnival where there's, you know, fire eaters and people dancing mm -hmm. on stage and stuff. So... Um, but that's that's the goal, and if it works, then maybe we'll do something like that internationally. But this is going to be the first time that anybody sees the finished movie, other than a few close friends. So it's it's going to be a weird night. Normally, I've already shown things a bunch, or I'm so comfortable with it that I know what to say or what. Like I have no idea what I'm going to say tonight. I like it's this is going to wow. be interesting. Now you guys are leaving me up there by myself. You're yeah, like, oh, you don't need a moderator. No, no, we I don't. I might actually need one this time. No, no, but listen, we just thought you'd. But it's your. It, listen, get used to it. You might as well go out there and start doing what you're going to do anyway. So you don't, you're not going to have anybody introduce you no. if you do that. So you might as well do it yourself. Right. And solely because of like you know, we're just too busy. We've got must Robert England, you know. Um, no, but listen, um, you're in prep on a new movie. Get, whatever you can tell us about that, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm about to start shooting a movie that. It was called Exorcism on Crooked Lake. Now we've been calling it Crooked Lake. So who knows what we'll be calling it by the time it's done a year from now. But it's a, uh, an exorcism movie, and it was written by the Doddle Brothers, who did Quarantine and Poughkeepsie Tapes. And uh, this, is one of the, this is only the second thing I'll ever direct that isn't something that was mine from the get-go. I've done a rewrite on it, but it's still their, their story. And what's great about it is every exorcism movie, it always, like the first hour is always meeting a normal family. And then there's like a, uh, 
a kid who's acting weird and they don't know what's wrong and all the scary stuff is happening so they bring the kid to a doctor and the doctor misdiagnoses the, the kid and then somebody says have you ever thought about talking to a priest and they're like no we're not religious we don't believe in that but then something really scary happens and so then the priest comes and he says have you ever heard of an exorcism and they go what what is that and then at the hour mark there's a kid strapped to a bed you know saying blasphemous stuff this movie starts with the priest going to do the exorcism and I don't think this is a spoiler because I think this is already online, but uh, when they get there, they realize the girl that they have to do the exorcism on is not only nine and a half months pregnant, but her water already broke and the child is coming. So it becomes like a real time thing. And there's also a satanic cult that is attacking the house at the same time. So um, it's it should be really fun and really cool. They're letting me at least... Right now, we haven't started shooting yet, but at least what I put into the script, they're letting me get away with some really, really horrible stuff, which I'm excited about. Um, and yeah, and I'm excited to do a, a serious one again, because I try to do you know, a fun one and a serious one. So um, I don't know where Marrow falls in that, but the movie before this was, was Hatchet 3, right? Yeah, Hatchet 3. So, um, so it was time to do something serious again. And then we'll go into the next season of Hollison, which hopefully, knock on metal, um, once we start season three, we should be able to start figuring out a UK release. But is that, that's not for Fear.net, which that's, what, where is season no, three? No, Fear.net is gone. Um, yeah, but so. even before season two aired, we were already trying to figure out a different way to do right. it. Because especially in America, I'm not sure how it is here, but... Nobody really watches TV on TV anymore. They mm. all watch it on on demand or Netflix. They binge watch it. Yeah. yeah. So we're trying to figure out a way to do the show where it can be accessible to everybody at the same time. And the problem with having a TV network was because it, it was never their show. We've always owned it. Mm. They just licensed it. But because they paid so much to license it, they didn't want any other places carrying it. But they were a very small network. So. There'd be all this promotion, and we would tour, and there'd be billboards and buses, which was fantastic. And then the show would come out, and nobody could see it. And then several months later, it would show up on iTunes, just like buried in the H's mm. somewhere. Mm. Or, so we're trying to come up with a, a new way of doing that. And we think we found the right partner now. We're just waiting for the paperwork to go through. But um, as a lot of people know, uh, Dave Brocky, who was the singer for Guar and who was on the show as my imaginary best friend, he passed away in March, and so I've needed a, a, a nice long break from the show before I'll be ready to go back. So we actually just had his public memorial um, last weekend, and uh, tonight uh, is uh, five months exactly since, since he passed away. So, And he's in Ding Up the Marrow, and, um, and he was one of the biggest champions of it when I told him the idea. And I was like, but this is so weird, and I don't know. And he's like, you know, look at me. Like, I'm in... Guar. He's like, uh, just do what you want to do. And like the people that don't believe, fuck them. And, um, and so we did it and, and, and here we are. So it's, it's cool. Well, you're in for an interesting evening. You know, a lot of people are going, looking forward to it, I have to say. The vibe in the cinema is really, you know, what's he turned out this time? Yeah, so. and I, I didn't know if that would be a mistake to not have a, a trailer accessible mm -hmm. or stills. Because I was like, well, are people going to come if they have no idea what it even is? And a few people have said that when I'm like, are you coming tonight? As they have me signing their hatch mm. and stuff. And they're like, well, no, I don't know what it is. Um, mm. But most are coming and they're excited that they don't know what it is. So um, I think that's just the best way to see it with no expectation. But it is funny that in trying to not hype something, that ended up hyping it because we didn't hype it. Right? <laughs> so like, no, either way, I can't win. Someone's going someone's gonna to say that. Afterwards, you're gonna say, "Oh, it was overhyped." I'm like, <laughs> I literally didn't say anything about it. So, <laughs> it's not good luck. I'm sure it's gonna work. And we're so you know, Joel joking aside, we love having you here. You know I that. I love being so, here. So, Adam Green, thanks so much. Thank you.